I'm on a one day break from touring with Jordan Peterson and joining me in studio today is a free speech lawyer and the director of the Individual Rights Defense Program at the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, AKA FIRE, Ari Cohen, welcome to the Rubin Report. Thanks for having me. That was a wordy intro right there. <laughs> a lot of freedom stuff in there and that, that's all the stuff that I like, so I'm looking forward to this. Same. So you guys, FIRE as an organization, is one of the, the few bastions of sanity these days. Like when I see what you guys are tweeting about and consistently defending the principles of free speech and free expression and open inquiry, I'm always like, ah, there are some good guys left. So first, uh, can you just tell me a little bit about the organization, why you guys got started, how you personally got involved? Well, we got started in 1999 uh, with a professor at Penn and a civil liberties lawyer uh, in Philadelphia who, where, you know, they both decided that there were, uh, there was a problem. There was an epidemic at our colleges and universities of the core individual rights that, that make up, you know, our, our constitution, if you will, um, as individuals, as people, as citizens of the United States, uh, that weren't being respected on campuses across the country. Back in 99, they 99. were this. Yeah, um, that's interesting because a lot of people say this is just a totally recent phenomenon. Well, I think, you know, a lot of it, the, there was the political correctness movement of the 80s and 90s a little bit. You know, that might have had something to do with it, but and this has been a problem since the free speech movement back at Berkeley, uh, you know, long before even the 80s or 90s, you know, censorship is an age old problem. It predates the United States of America, mm -hmm. really. Uh, and as Alan and Harvey, you know, went about creating fire and they decided to locate it in, like, locate it in Philadelphia, which is, you know, the birthplace of our nation, uh, they really got an outpouring of people saying, hey, this happened to me too. Uh, and they said, well, this is, you know, this is a problem. This is an epidemic. We need to fix it. And then fire was born um, or, or lit, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, over the years, getting close to 20 now, crazy enough, uh, that has actually just gone up every year. More and more people reach out to fire for help. Uh, you know, when I got to fire uh, for the second time, I actually was a legal fellow of fire after I graduated from law school before I started in private practice. Uh, but when I came back in 2013, I'm getting several hundred case submissions a year. Um, and now we are getting damn near close to a thousand a year. Wow, uh, incredible. And, and that's just the stuff that we hear about. And uh -huh. Can only imagine how much other stuff is going on around the country for people who don't know that we're out there to help them uh, or you know, people who perhaps go about it themselves. Uh, it's, it's crazy to think about how much is going on. Yeah, so I wanna talk about some of those cases and some of the specific work <coughs> that you're doing, but Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. I am a believer right now, partly because of Kanye West and because of a lot of people online right now, that the individual is making a comeback, that the idea of the individual versus the collective is actually making a comeback. Do you have any idea when they came up with the name for FIRE, why it was so important to put the individual front and center? I think it's, you know, and, and I'm speaking, you know, out of some level of ignorance because I, I haven't actually discussed this with either of them uh, personally, but, you know, if I had to guess, it's it's because the the individual qualities, the freedom of conscience, the freedom of speech, the things that allow us to participate in society, we don't get to the collective unless we have the individuals. One is necessary to have the other, because what is a collective other than a group of individuals? Mm -hmm. Consensus is a bunch of individual opinions that throughout the process of winnowing and debating different good ideas and bad ideas, we reach a common understanding, we reach a, uh, you know, a, a norm for society, and that's, how, that's why free speech particularly is so important, is because that's how we get to the optimal resolution, the optimal conclusions, that's how we reach these communal positions, is only through our own personal expressions of what we believe, which exposes us to criticism or agreement or just flat out discussion with other people. So how do you think the ideas of the collective took root so much at college campus then? Well, I think there's the give and take in society at large that we really go through every once in a while in terms of thinking about things as individualistic and then 
worrying about broader concerns of the community. And that's not altogether a bad thing. And I think the college campus, and it's always been this way, it's a microcosm of what we're experiencing in the broader society. And I think that's another reason why it's so important to protect individual rights on college campuses, uh, because where they fall on college campuses, they're almost certainly sure to fall in society writ large. Yeah, so that actually, we discussed this briefly right before the cameras turned on. That's my concern about this. When people say, oh, you know, there isn't a free speech issue on college campuses, and even though I keep going to college campuses, and it's very clear to me that there is a free speech problem there, that it's not what's gonna happen. It's not just these screaming kids right now. It's not that. It's that these are the people that are going to be in leadership positions five, 10, 15 years in the future and, and further than that, obviously. And if those ideas take root because they were able to silence us, once they're the lawmakers, once they're in charge of public policy, they're not gonna be too kind to the people who they were silencing way back when, right? Yeah, I mean, that's really one of the key problems. And it's not even just if they get elected to power, even if they aren't elected uh, and they don't rise to power and they can't impose these views on other people, these are future citizens, even if they're not necessarily future leaders. Mm -hmm. And the discourse of the nation, if that is the, the prevalent feeling in society, is going to suffer tremendously as a result. If even if they're not in Congress or in the state legislatures, if 50% of the country's population thinks that we shouldn't be talking about certain things, we're not going to talk about these things and it's going to be uh, societally imposed if nothing else. And I think that's incredibly damaging to just about every aspect of our life as, as a country. Yeah, it's so interesting to me because I know you, you read about this, but I was at the University of New Hampshire a couple weeks ago and you know, first we were supposed to give a speech on campus, then about two hours before they announced that they couldn't secure the room, that they felt there were too many threats. So there were about 200 or 250 people supposed to be in the room. They moved us to the hockey rink which seats 7,500 people. <laughs> so I stood in front of a, a little you know, backdrop and I talked to about 200 people. It was about 150 people that were there to listen and be respectful and all that stuff. And then there were about probably about 50 protesters, roughly, those are the rough numbers. Um, but the desire just to shout down, to use noisemakers, to scream, to chant like robots, they love robotic chants, all of these things. And I kept saying to them, guys, do you have any direct questions? Is there something that I've said that you disagree with? Or is there something you'd directly like to ask me? And time and time again, the answer was no. And I don't know how you break them out of that, other than keep having these conversations and hope that the refugees make it to us. And that's a common problem. I, I think it really comes down to ideological purity that people are after. The idea that if I disagree with you on something, whether small or even fundamental, if I disagree, disagree with you on that one thing, that means nothing that you have to say could possibly be of value to me. And that is completely false. You couldn't be farther from the truth. We yeah. can learn so much from the people we disagree with the most. Even if I disagreed with you on absolutely everything, it would still be incredibly valuable for me to talk to you, if only because that helps me sharpen and really understand why I believe what I believe in. And people really discount the importance of understanding why you believe something. Yeah, so the argument that I've been making for a while is that, and I do think right now, at least in 2018, this is more of a problem on the left, that they've owned the ideas and the narrative and the college campus discussion and academia and media and all that, they've owned that for so long that the reason these kids end up, be, or these students end up being so hysterical is because they never hear counter ideas. So then you get a pretty moderate guy who's arguing about liberty and freedom for everybody and live and let live, and that actually offends them because they never hear anything outside of what they're being taught. That goes to the academic <coughs> part, I think, mostly. Well, I think we're doing a really crappy job of educating students before they get to college about why free speech and our other rights are important. Civics education is clearly in the toilet right now. Yeah. Uh, and it's bizarre to me. I grew up in Skokie, Illinois, one of the sites of one of the most famous free speech cases you know, in recent history. Yeah, can you lay it out for those and, that don't know the, the story? In the 70s, the American, the American Socialist Party, the Nationalist Party, the 
Illinois Nazis, if you'd ask the Blues Brothers, yeah. wanted to march through Skokie, Illinois, which outside of New York had the largest concentration of Holocaust survivors in the United States. Uh, and Skokie tried to stop them. And uh, they sued with the aid of the American Civil Liberties Union of Illinois. And it went to, well, both the Supreme Court of Illinois and the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, and the Nazis had the right to march and, and the courts held so. And there were threats of violence and disruption and, and all, of, you know, people outcrying as to how this could be allowed. but. Ultimately, uh, the Nazis had the First Amendment right to march through Skokie, and I grew up learning about that case from a very young age. I can't tell you how many times I saw the movie they made about it. Yeah. And it really, it got me thinking at a young age about why this is important, how I think about it, and I can't tell you that as a young child, I completely agree that the Nazis should have a right to march. You know, mm -hmm. I, when I was that young, I, part of me didn't grasp the overarching fundamental importance of free speech, but I was thinking about it at least, yeah. and I got there, and I get the feeling that sometimes we're not doing enough to make our students think about why it's important. Yeah, it's such an important case, and I'm glad you mentioned it, because it goes really to the heart of this, that the people that lived in Skokie, as you said, the second largest amount of Holocaust survivors in the country, these people literally survived a genocide. Probably virtually all of them lost, some of them probably lost all of their family members and friends and all of that. And yet I would sit here as someone that lost Holocaust survivors on both sides of my family and tell you it was the right decision. You can't let the, the Nazis or the white supremacists or whatever they are, you can't let them start ransacking property, you can't let them start killing people or harming people, but letting, letting them march, that's the exchange of free speech. And it's kind of shitty, but you got to defend it when it's hard to defend. Well, you have to defend it when it's hard to, to defend because otherwise there's, it's not going to be around to defend when it's easy to defend. Uh, you know, once you yeah. start creating exceptions and encroaching, uh, there's no end to it. And, you know, we've kind of seen even in other countries uh, that once the, the encroachments start, it's always, well, we make that exception and just this one other small exception. Mm -hmm. And then there's inevitably another one and another one and all for perhaps even, you know, good reasons in terms of, you know, ideals and, and the, the goals are, are laudable perhaps. I but say it every show, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Exactly. I'm getting tired of saying it's, it. Yeah. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it, it's really practically speaking, it's inevitable. Yeah. How much of this is just a confusion as to what the First Amendment is? That's also what I've started to realize because when I've gone on college campuses and the protesters are there, and I always say it, I welcome peaceful protests, I completely welcome, I welcome the exchange of ideas, the questions, all of that. But when, when they're screaming about certain things, I think there's just a disconnect as to what, I think two legal things. I think what the First Amendment is and what hate speech is, is or isn't. Uh, so can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I, if I had to have to hear one more person, whether it be student, uh, internet commenter, even journalists or faculty members sometimes say hate speech hate. is not free speech, I'm going to lose it. Okay, um, so let's do, let's do that one first, because <laughs> I, I really, I mean, this will be maybe what we promo for this episode, but I really want people to understand this. Why is hate speech free speech? Well, on a legal level, hate speech is free speech because uh, the First Amendment and, and the courts have said nothing about free or hate speech being unprotected by the First Amendment. Speech is protected by the First Amendment unless it falls under one of the very few existing categories of unprotected speech. Yeah, what are, what are those categories? Uh, there's incitement to imminent lawless action, uh, and these all have very high bars. Right. True threats and intimidation. Uh, you can be sued for uh, libel or slander, uh, defamation as they're known. Uh, some st states, I think, actually still have criminal statutes on the book, b books, but they're rarely enforced. Mm -hmm. uh, fraud, obscenity, which people often confuse with mere profanity or lewdness, but they are not the same thing by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. what, what's the difference on those two? Well, profanity and lewdness are generally protected by the First Amendment. Obscenity is a very high bar. It's speech that has to be, or expression, I, I should say, more broadly than just speech, uh, that has to appeal to the prurient interest, which is an inordinate fascination with sex, mm -hmm. uh, describe or depict sex in a patently offensive way, and have no social, political, literary, or artistic value uh, whatsoever. And to get down in the, in the mud, uh, have you ever heard of crush videos? 
I feel like I have, but I'm honestly not sure what that is. They are videos of women wearing stilettos crushing small animals like oh. hamsters and gerbils to death, and people apparently get off on that. Yeah. Um, it's, I don't Jesus. pretend to understand it. Even that is not wholly unprotected by the obscenity exception to the First Amendment. That, that's a particularly interesting case, I suppose, because the idea of it, talking about it, seems like uh, I would have no problem with that, but the action itself, probably there's some legal reasons, right? Like killing, right. killing animals, there's some law, I guess it's probably state law. Right, but if you have this uh, pornography, if you can call it that, I just I have a hard time getting it. Yeah. Um, if you have it and you to possess it or oh, distribute see, it, uh, you can't be prosecuted for, for possessing that obscene material. It's um, an interesting distinction that the act is the crime or the act is what is illegal, not the depiction, depiction or the disseminating of the information or that sort of thing. Right, uh, child pornography, obviously not protected by the First Amendment. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but there's, well, there's the one additional wrinkle of the fighting words doctrine, although there's um, considerable doubt that it remains a viable uh, exception to the First Amendment, uh, but it really uh, gets brought up a lot in the hate speech debate. Um, to the extent it still exists, it's limited to face-to-face -face interactions, mm -hmm. where say I say something to you that is so insanely abusive that you are likely to punch me in the face without thinking twice about it instead of taking a deep breath and either ignoring me or coming back at me. Uh, and there's reasons why it's fallen into disuse and it's worthwhile to note that the Supreme Court hasn't upheld a fighting words conviction since the case in the 40s when it created the fighting words wow, exception. that's interesting. Which is how far it's fallen into disuse. Uh, it incentivizes punching people in the face. Right. It creates an easy way to censor the people that you disagree with. And it would, I assume, be some level of a subjective piece of information as to what you think is offensive at the it's highest order is it. different perhaps than what I think, or exactly. certainly what some of these other people think. Yeah, it, it, it creates terrible incentives and it would basically lead to an institutionalized heckler's veto, uh, so it's really not tenable. Yeah, so on the, on the hate speech front, which w it's clear what the Supreme Court has said about hate speech, you're allowed to do it with, with these exceptions that you've just laid out. You're allowed to say mean things. What, I, what I'm realizing on college campuses is they really don't like that. The people, the, the set of people that we're talking about, they really don't like that. So like, they think if you, like you, it's just a fact. You are allowed to say bad things. You can say, I hate all the Jews. You can say, I hate all the black people or all the gays or whatever. You can say it. You can't cause direct call to violence. But what I think they think is that if you keep saying those things, I hate these people, that it's going to incite violence. Now my counter argument would be no, you have to use free speech to counter those bad ideas. That's the whole purpose of free speech. But do you see that, that that seems to be the slope that they consistently are on? That if we allow you to say, I, I hate these people, which is bigoted and prejudiced and all of those things, but it's afforded to us uh, by the Bill of Rights, they think that that's going to get you to violence. How, how do you combat that notion, if you agree with the premise? Well, you know, that is something that we tend to hear a lot in the First Amendment world. Um, and, you know, first of all, generally speaking in this country, we punish the people who do the bad acts. If I watch your show and I get some kooky idea and go off and, you know, commit some crime, we're not going to throw you in jail because I'm an idiot and took a terrible idea that you didn't even intend me to take. Right, now it might, be, it might be different though if I was up here saying you should violently attack these people, et cetera, et cetera. Right, exactly, yeah. and that's why the incitement standard is so high, it has to be likely to incite and intended to incite immediate criminal action. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I tell you, hey, you know, it'd be fun to burn down a building, but you're not likely to do it, uh, you're gonna take it as a joke, I probably haven't you know, committed any kind of, uh, you know, unlawful expression. If I know you're a pyromaniac and I say, <laughs> hey Dave, let's go burn down a building, right. uh, I might, you know, find myself in a very different situation. Yeah, yeah. I sort of left that phase at about eight years old, but you know, <laughs> um, you're all right. But, you know, I think that if you take a look, one of my colleagues actually wrote a, a piece for Quillette uh, not so long ago about the Rwandan genocide mm -hmm. and looking over the claims that the radio broadcasts actually you know, caused more violence. And what it turns out is that the radio broadcasts, first of all, only incited 
people who were already predisposed and who already felt that way, and they, it made it marginally easier for mm -hmm. them to find people and you know be taught how to do certain things. Uh, but it was relatively ineffective, as it turns out, in convincing people who weren't already in a murderous rage to go out and commit violence. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that the fear that allowing these views to be aired is going to indisputably cause actual violence is somewhat overblown. Now, there's a second part to it, which is that people expressing these views might lead to more people adopting those views and having prejudiced views. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Absolutely. Right, so that's the part I was referencing. But that's right? kind of the point, is that we put those views out there so we can fight them. Mm -hmm. If we don't have them in public and we can't fight them, they're still gonna spread. Nothing, no idea ever went away because we said you can't say that. It just doesn't work like that. Yeah, how does the heckler's veto fit into all of this? Because one of the things that I again see on college campuses is when hecklers start screaming at you, <laughs> and then you say, just a second, you know, if I'll get to your question or calm down or whatever you <laughs> might say, um, they'll say, well, I have a right to free speech too. And they try to flip it on you to make you look like a hypocrite. That actually kind of kind of gets me, but I will give them a little bit of credit. I think, you say a university event and somebody comes in and they chant for 30 seconds or they stand up and turn their backs. And that's the extent of it. I think that we should protect that. Technically, are they causing a disruption? Yes, but it's minimal and it's actually maximized the amount of free speech. There has to be some room for very minimal disruption. Yeah. But when it gets to the point where they are substantially interfering with the speaker's ability to get their message across or the audience's ability to hear them through repeated shouting or noisemakers or you know, standing in the front and blocking everyone's views uh, and things like that, obviously that's a problem. And last year we just saw a rash of of the heckler's vetoes going on, and it kind of all started with Berkeley and Milo Yiannopoulos. Yeah. Uh, when the protesters were successful in shutting down the event through uh, what had bef before that been unfathomable on a college campus for an invited speaker. We've seen invited speaker controversies since FIRE was founded, basically. Mm -hmm. Never, ever am I aware of any incident that came close to something like that. It was just madness. Yeah. And they got away with it. The so few arrests were made. And I can't help but wonder if the students out at Middlebury Car College where Charles Murray was speaking seized on that and looked at the Berkeley students and said, Well, they were successful in stopping that event with speech that we also detested, and they got away with it. So let's try that. It's a viable tactic. This might be a, a solution for keeping this speech we disagree with off campus. Uh, and ideas like that, the, the tactics that students are able to successfully utilize, they will. Behavior that is rewarded, essentially, is going to be repeated. Yeah, and I see that all over the place right now. So for example, just a couple months after Milo went to Berkeley and that happened, uh, ben Shapiro spoke there, and it was largely nonviolent, but it cost the university $600,000 to make that happen. I mean, I think an ATM was broken and a couple windows and that's it. But that's part of the tactic, is if we can keep ramping this up, we'll keep pushing the security costs. And as I said, they had to move my event to a freaking hockey theater, that uh, you know, hockey arena, that couldn't have been cheap. And, and several other of these, I saw, I'm sure you're familiar with the case of Lindsay Shepard up at Wilfrid Laurier in mm -hmm. Canada. And she just had to crowdfund, I think around six grand, to get security for one of her events. So that almost seems like the new tactic. It's almost like we don't have to, we can scare them with some threats of violence and some other stuff, and then we'll cause the security costs to be so high that you guys will just give up. Well, and that's another problem we've been fighting since even before all of this came to a head is uh, colleges and universities trying to charge student groups security fees for the speakers based on the anticipated protest or mm -hmm. controversy, uh, and that's, plainly unconstitutional. It has been for a long time since the Supreme Court said that a listener's reaction is not a content-neutral basis for regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot charge 
more for controversial speakers because they might draw protest. That places a, f a price tag on expression and prices, like you said, it'll price the controversial expression out of the marketplace. They're not going to be able to afford it. What student group has $17,000 to spend on security? None of them. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, what it comes down to is administrators, the university itself has to be the guarantor of last resort when it comes to the speaker's ability to speak. And this is the business they are in. And sometimes it's unpleasant and sometimes it, it costs a whole lot of money. But if you're not going to have a campus where we can discuss things and we can debate things, even if it gets loud and boisterous and raucous and contentious, which is everything free speech should be. Yeah. If your campus isn't going to be a place where that occurs, then what are you, what are you doing? So I do want to make a point of saying that some of the campuses are getting it right. And I'm sure you know some of the campuses that are doing a little better than some of the others. Uh, but for example, uh, at the beginning of September, uh, 2017, I spoke at Claremont McKenna at their, they're doing a big free speech push because of what happened the semester before with Heather McDonald and all hell broke loose on the campus. And I was completely welcome there. And they, even some of the students who disagreed with me, I mean, they asked healthy questions and, and all of that good stuff. So it's, we're, I always think it's worth mentioning that some schools are doing their best to manage some of this stuff. Absolutely, and on two levels, I think. You know, first of all, fire rates policies at schools. We rate over 400 different uh, colleges and universities on a red light, yellow light, green light level. Uh, red light being you have policies that are clearly and substantially unconstitutional. Yellow light being you have policies that are susceptible to being applied in bad ways. Mm -hmm. And green light schools where none of their policies pose a, th a serious threat to free speech. In the past couple of years, the number of green light schools that we have has nearly doubled, uh, which is tremendous. Mm -hmm. Now, still close to 60% of schools have a yellow light, so there's work to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, but you combine that with the 38 schools that have now put out statements expressly committing themselves to free speech, uh, something that you know the University of Chicago kicked off yeah. a while back. Yeah. Uh, there's reasons to be hopeful, and we work regularly with administrators uh, who are happy to have us, you know, consult on their policies and say, you know, here are the changes we would make. Uh, and and we are we have amicable relationships with so many administrators, which is really gratifying. But on the student side, also, part of it is overblown, I think, by media. There are a lot of students out there who do get it, yeah, and people of all ideologies and all political uh, you know, sides, there are a lot of students out there who get it. I speak to them on a daily basis. Yeah. And I, there is a lot of reason to, to have hope. Uh, yeah, this is I, not a lost cause. No, I agree. I think it's important talking about it because even, again, at that University of New Hampshire thing, 75% of the crowd at least was there respectfully, decently to hear ideas and, and do that. What I felt was important after and why I still want to talk about it and have you here and all that is because I want people to be armed with the right arguments so that when these, this set of people, even if it's just a smaller set that's just really loud so has a disproportionate amount of influence, I want people to understand there are tactics you can use to, to fight it. So I'm curious on that list of 38 schools that's kind of doing it right right now, when they've instituted some of these policies, and I remember when University of Chicago did it about a year ago, um, is there evidence that things actually get better? Because I'm gonna guess that when you give some rules, some of these students, they don't wanna be kicked out of school and they might actually behave better. Well, so I think you know, this, there's a lot of conversation right now about some legislation even that's going on about uh, disrupting speeches and mandatory punishments for students who do so a certain number of times. And mm -hmm. you know, I think that's actually less important, and I actually have uh, somewhat of a problem with laws that create mandatory punishments for vaguely defined terms like disrupt, which, you know, could be applied to pretty much anything that a sneeze, you know. Yeah. It's, <laughs> um, but I think more important is when administration is saying, hey, these are the values that really, that this is 
the wellspring of intellectual vitality that our institution relies on. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the, the ideals you should be paying attention to. This is what's gonna make your experience really worthwhile. I think students will, will listen to that instead of maintaining the policies that say, thou shalt not say mean things about you know, right. uh, your classmates. Uh, that gets students in a very different mindset when they come to college. Right, what, what are the statements, or, or what are the principles that you, uh, you guys wanna see in those statements? I, the principles are just largely, this is a place of debate. This is a place of intellectual exploration. It is not our job as administrators or as faculty members to silence ideas that we find controversial or protect you from them. It is our, our job, it is our you know, mission to expose you even to ideas that you might disagree with and give you the tools that you need to analyze them think critically about them, formulate your own ideas, and participate in the conversation. Because that's what you're gonna have to do when you leave after four or however many years you're here. That's part of life in our democracy, is participation. If you don't participate, then, you know, as the saying goes, if you don't participate, you have no grounds to complain. Uh, we have to, you know, really get students in the mindset that, these are important life skills, and they're important even in other instances. In the workplace, they can be important. If you have a, a policy position, if you're working at a company that you think is either bad or is one that you want to promote, you have to be able to think about the people who disagree with you and what they're going to say, anticipate their response, and formulate an argument that resolves it. You know, there's countless situations in the world outside of college where being able to think critically is incredibly important. And, and really, uh, I think that you get a lot of value out of doing that outside of the classroom, because it teaches you how to contextualize the skill. Mm -hmm. It teaches you how to apply it not just in the, I read this assignment, let's talk about it kind of way. Because that's really not how life works once you graduate. I wish it was, it would make things a whole lot simpler. But <laughs> You'd be out of a job, probably. That's true, I, I would have to find something else to do. <laughs>